Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webcast, Novel Trick or Critical Component, How Does Cyber Deception Fit into Modern Security Architecture? My name is Randall Jones. I'm the Offensive Operations Marketing Manager here at SANS, and I'll be moderating today's webcast. Uh, today's featured speaker is Mr. Kevin Fiscus. Kevin is the founder and lead consultant of Cyber Defense Advisors, where he performs security and risk assessments, vulnerability and penetration testing, as well as security program design. And as a SANS principal instructor, Kevin has taught just about every single popular course we've had here. It covers security essentials, penetration courses over network, web, mobile, uh, our, as well as our training program for the CISSP certification. Uh, he has now also written our new course related to today's topic, Security 550, Cyber Deception, Attack Detection, Disruption, and Active Defense. If you have any questions for Kevin during the webcast, please enter them into the Q&A window at any time. And please note that our webcast is being recorded and will be available for viewing later in your SANS account under my webcast. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Kevin. Awesome, Randall. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And uh, good, <clears throat> I guess, depending upon where you are, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, uh, and welcome to our discussion on cyber deception. Um, a couple things, uh, just a, a quick uh, little bit of, uh, I guess Randall already covered some of this stuff, but uh, as Randall has said, I'm a principal instructor with SANS. Uh, I have taught a whole bunch of classes. Right now, I'm predominantly teaching uh, the Security 504, which is uh, uh, hacker techniques uh, and incident handling, uh, Security 560, which is enterprise penetration testing, and Security 580, which is a two-day class on Metasploit. And as was mentioned as well, I'm also the primary course author for a brand new SANS class. Uh, the class has been run twice before, sort of an alpha run and a beta run. And <clears throat> excuse me, we are working to get it on the schedule coming up. So if the topics that you see and we talk about throughout uh, you know, this, this event are of interest to you, definitely take a look at that. It'll be Security 550, Cyber Deception, Attack Detection, uh, Disruption, and Active Defense. Uh, so with, that, with no further ado, I'm just going to go ahead and get into our agenda for today. And what I want to do, uh, Randall had said, if you have any questions, please go ahead and, and drop them in the Q&A um, you know, section. I absolutely encourage that. Um, I encourage questions. I encourage pushback. I encourage, you know, if, if, if you don't, uh, if you don't, if something doesn't track with you uh, that I say on here, challenge me on it, right? Uh, um, you know, throw out whatever you can. Um, because again, uh, I want this to be as interactive as it can possibly be. So what we're going to be talking about is really in general, we're going to talk about the, the topic of cyber deception. We're going to cover a little bit about what cyber deception is. Now, as we will see as we go through some of the content, one of the challenges with cyber deception is that it is a concept that doesn't have a defined goal. Uh, there are a lot of things you can do with cyber deception, uh, detecting bad guys on your network, distracting and disrupting those attacks, keeping the bad guys away from your production, um, uh, your production resources. Um, we can collect advanced threat intelligence without being required to suffer a breach. Uh, we can even, if used correctly, utilize cyber deception to stop attacks before they even happen. Now, with all of these benefits, uh, it's a little bit overwhelming and can kind of come across as being uh, almost like this mythical, you know, silver bullet, magic wand type of thing. So we're not going to focus on all of the potential benefits, but we are going to focus on some of the most urgent issues that we have today and how cyber deception can help solve those problems. Now, the next thing that we're going to talk about involves other technologies and other concepts, because there's always this question of what does cyber deception replace? Or if I have technology X, uh, do I need cyber deception? And so we're going to spend some time talking about how cyber deception fits into an overall security architecture, and then more specifically, how some advanced or, or maybe sort of uh, newer ideas fit into cyber deception. So we're going to talk about uh, cyber deception uh, as it relates to things like adversary emulation and red team and purple team exercises. Uh, we're going to talk about cyber deception uh, 
uh, as it relates to zero trust architectures and how zero trust can come into play, uh, a few more things as well. So it's kind of the overall agenda that we have for today. And again, questions, comments, all of that kind of stuff are more than welcome. I'm going to keep my eye on the Q&A section and the chat window. Uh, again, if anything does pop up. And there will be some time, hopefully, for questions and answers at the end. So let's jump into and have a conversation about the problem that we are going to solve with cyber deception. The first topic that I want to talk about is something called dwell time. So dwell time uh, is defined in the Mandiant M Trends report as the number of days an attacker is present in a victim environment before they are detected. So bad guy has compromised your environment. They're in, they're moving around, they're doing things. How much time are we going to give the bad guys on our network before we even discover that they're there? We're not even talking at this point about responding to the incident. We're just talking about detection. Now, there are two reports that I came across that talk about dwell time. The first one is the 2022 uh, FireEye Mandiant M Trends Report. Now, if you're not familiar with FireEye and Mandiant, so Mandiant uh, was a company that was acquired by FireEye, merged with FireEye, whatever, uh, but they did a whole bunch of incident response and forensics investigations and you know all of that kind of fun stuff. Uh, so they were acquired by FireEye, but they always put out the, what they call their M Trends Report. Now, the M Trends Report analyzes uh, well, in most cases, the M Trends report analyzed cases that Mandiant investigated over the previous 12 months. Now, in this particular one, I'm not sure if it was due to COVID or whatever, but in this particular one, it was actually 18 months worth of data. Doesn't really matter. So, um, in, in the M Trends report, they talk about the median dwell time being 28 days. So almost perfectly four weeks, right? So according to Mandiant, on uh, the median time, I say on average as a non-math person, generic speak, uh, but it's technically the median amount of time that the bad guys stay on the network before being detected is 28 days, so four weeks. Now, there's also another report called the Ponemon Institute Cost of a Data Breach Report. That report, which is not uh, a, a specific collection of one organization's clients, uh, but it is, I want to say, between five and 600 different organizations around the world that are interviewed. According to the Ponemon Institute Cost of a Data Breach Report, the latest one we have is from 2021, the average amount of time that the bad guys are on our network before being detected is 212 days. So that's what, close to nine months, something like that. Now, before we move on from that, I want to kind of talk about what could be the, uh, the proverbial elephant in the room. Why does M Trend say 28 days and the Ponemon report say 212 days? I don't have access to the raw data, any of that kind of stuff. So I'm making some assumptions here. And then I'm going to talk about why they don't matter. So the assumption that I'm making is first and foremost, the M Trends report is taken only from organizations that contracted with Mandiant FireEye to do incident response. Now, just my gut feeling is that, um, that those organizations are generally going to have more mature security programs than the average organization, which is sort of what the Ponemon Institute study is looking at. So when I, now there is also another statistical possibility that because we're in one case, we're talking about median and the other case, we're talking about average. If you have some weird outliers uh, that can more easily skew the average uh, than the uh, than the mean. But anyway, so great. So we've got somewhere between 28 days and 212 days as this kind of general average thing. Now, if you want to look at this from the perspective of the 28 days is for organizations with better security programs, the 212 days might be for the average company. In all honesty, I don't really care. Because I'm going to, the question that I have is, <clears throat> are you perfectly comfortable with allowing a bad guy to move around your network for four weeks before you have a clue that they're there, let alone 212 days? So, <clears throat> excuse me, when we look at this, whether we're talking about four weeks, whether we're talking about nine months, I'm not sure it really matters because there's a significant amount of harm that can happen in those 28 days, 
let alone the 212 days. So dwell time is a problem. As an industry, we do, generally speaking, a bad job of detecting bad guys on our network. And that also by definition means we do a bad job of responding to bad guys on our network because it takes us so long to detect them. Now, let's put this in contrast. We're gonna talk about breakout time. So breakout time is the time between gaining initial access and then full lateral movement. In other words, the bad guy gets a foothold in your network. Uh, the time between that and then you know, scanning, identifying additional targets, elevating their permissions, exploiting new vulnerabilities, and moving laterally. That's breakout time. Now, according to the 2022 CrowdStrike Global Threat Report, the average breakout time for attackers is one hour and 38 minutes. In other words, the attacker gains initial access. An hour and 38 minutes later, they're moving throughout your network. That should be terrifying particularly given that it takes us 28 days, even with the, the best case scenario, to discover that they're even there. Now, I couldn't find this data any newer than this, so this might not be entirely accurate today, but it gives you an idea of what's possible. In the 2019 CrowdStrike Global Threat Report, it broke the breakout time down to different threat groups. So general cybercrime games, gangs, nine hours and 42 minutes. All right. That is at least longer than a working day for, mo for some people, right? Iranian-sponsored threat groups, five hours and nine minutes. Chinese-sponsored threat groups, four hours. North Korean-sponsored threat groups, two hours and 20 minutes. And Russian-sponsored threat groups, 18 minutes and 49 seconds. That means that any way that you look at it, within a day, the bad guys are moving throughout our network which means that we've got 27 more days to allow the bad guy just to kind of do what they want on our networks until we detect them, even using the best case scenario, that, couldn't, that number could be 211 days, right? So this is a bad deal. Now, as we look at this, just to kind of put this in perspective, when we look at those numbers, dwell time, 28 to 212 days, sort of on average, breakout time, 19 to 582 minutes. What that means is the breakout time consumes between 0.18 and 1.4% of dwell time. In other words, over 98% of the, the attacker's time on our network is going to be them moving around our network without us having any knowledge of them. And again, that becomes a huge big deal. Now, this becomes more important, and these numbers are from the, uh, the 2021 Ponemon Institute Cost of a Data Breach Study. They show, now the way that the Ponemon study breaks this down is they show the cost of a breach if detection and response, um, <clears throat> identification and containment is kind of what they call it, but detection and response takes less than 200 days versus whether, you know, when it takes more than 200 days. And if you can look down here, going back as far as 2015, in every single case, if detection takes over 200 days, it is significantly more expensive than if it takes less than 200 days. Now, that shouldn't be surprising to anyone. Like that's not, that's not a shocking statistic because it's sort of expected. But if you look at some of the percentages, right, um, it's a significant deal, right? The lowest difference is about 25%. <clears throat> so in other words, if it takes us longer than 200 days, that breach is going to cost over 25% more, as much as 42%, you know, is somewhere in that ballpark, you know, give or take about 35% is what we're looking at. So the ability to detect and respond more effectively and to do it more quickly is going to have a direct uh, effect on the cost of a data breach, right? And, and whether you look at all these numbers and go, well, these numbers don't apply to me, I'm a small company, whatever, it doesn't matter. What matters is there is a direct relationship between the time it takes to detect and respond to a breach and the cost of that breach. So delayed response means the breach costs more, and that is a big deal. Now, there is another bit of a problem that is related to this detection thing, 
And this has to do with security operations center inefficiencies. So I went through and I looked at a few different studies there. Uh, the Ponemon Exabeam Sim Productivity Study uh, that was released a couple of years ago, 33% of SOC alerts are false positives. There was an article again a little while ago on uh, healthnetsecurity.com. Uh, the article was talking about SOC alert overload. 82% of respondents reported that more than 25% of their alerts are false. 37% stated that 25 to 50% were false. 36% stated that 50 to 75% were false. 9% stated that 75 to 99% of their alerts were false. Uh, kind of supporting this, the Exabeam State of the Security Operations Center report talked about false positives were a concern for 27% of organizations, 24% stated alert fatigue is a significant pain point, and 39% stated keeping up with alerts is their biggest challenge. Now, why am I going through all of these numbers and statistics and all this? It, and it boils down to a problem that we have when it comes to attack detection. Uh, there are a few issues that we have for attack detection. One of those issues relates directly to that sock overload false positive thing. The fact of the matter is when we look at detection environments, tradi you know, traditional IDS, IPS, log management, you know, EDR, XDR, uh, when we look at the number of logs that are generated in any given organization in any given day, we could be talking about tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of log entries on any given day. Um, and so the problem that we run into, and I, I pulled up some numbers, uh, and, and some of the numbers that I found indicate that uh, a traditional SOC is getting an alert every two to nine seconds, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, the problem with this is if an attack is actually detected, it's going to get mixed up in all of the false positives and not only the false positives, but the maybe true alerts that just aren't interesting. In other words, there's a lot of noise and it is entirely possible for a valid actual alert to just get missed because of all the noise making things worse, a lot of times our detective technology doesn't even catch uh, the attack because most of our detective technology is focused on looking for evil, right? In other words, we have some sort of signature or behavioral analysis or some heuristics analysis that says what I just saw was evil. Now, that is an important thing to understand when it comes to detective technology. Because if we are looking for the presence of evil, what we're saying is, if I see evil, generate an alert. If I see anything else, do not generate an alert. So what we're saying is, look for A, B, and C. If I don't see A, B, and C, then don't generate an alert. Well, attackers do a really good job of making evil appear not evil. Or putting it a different way, all the attacker has to do is something that the detective technology is not looking for, and they can evade detection. So when we slap these guys together, when bad guys do a good job of appearing not evil, and even if they do get caught, in many cases, the alert is missed because of the volume of alerts that are being generated in our environments. That's why we do a really bad job of detecting bad guys. So here's what I'm going to uh, put out there. I'm thinking a significant paradigm change is in order. So what does that look like? Well, it looks very simple. It says, instead of looking for evil, or maybe in addition to looking for evil, we should be looking for abnormal. Now, there are a bunch of technologies out there that can, can, are focused on looking for abnormal behavior in our networks. One of the most uh, you know, talked about uh, new thing that's out there is what's called user and entity behavioral analytics. So the idea is we're gonna install technology that for a while is going to monitor behavior on our network. We're going to get a normalized baseline and then it will generate alerts if anything changes. Now, that's a really awesome idea. And if it can be implemented well, that's freaking fantastic. It's amazing. It's, it's cool stuff. The problem is normal changes all the time, right? Normal changed 
when COVID hit because everybody started working remotely. Normal can change based on the deployment of a new technology, based upon a new business strategy. So trying to normalize a network can be really, really difficult. Now, you can get widely, you know, wide coverage user and entity behavioral analytics, which are really challenging because they try to normalize virtually everything. You can get narrowly focused user and entity behavior analytics. I'm only going to look at logins, for example. Those are easier to deploy, but they're only looking at a small subset of behavior on the network. So what I'm putting out there is instead of looking for evil, let's look for normal, but let's also redefine what normal is. And when I say redefine, what we are going to do as part of our cyber deception strategy is we are going to place resources on our network. Now those resources could be a file, they could be a directory, they could be credentials or a user account, they could be a, an open port, a listening service, an entire computer, um, an entire network of computers, a wireless network, there's all kinds of things. So we're gonna, in, we're gonna put resources on our production network but those resources are not production resources. They are not meant to be used by anybody on a day-to-day -day basis. And because these, these resources are non-production, what that means is we can now define normal as no interaction. So if I stick a listening port or a file or even a computer on the network, nobody should ever open or access that file. Nobody should ever connect up to that port and nobody should ever interact with that computer. If somebody does, it is by definition abnormal. So we have now changed from looking for evil to looking for abnormal, but we are now defining a very specific set of criteria as to what normal is. Normal is no interaction. This has the result of creating what is in effect a high fidelity, low noise detection capability. Now, it is absolutely possible for there to be a quote unquote false positive. A user could get bored and do something that they're not really supposed to do. The security team could be port scanning the network. There are reasons why an alert could be generated in this specific circumstance. But <clears throat> if that happens, you're going to instantly know what IP address that alert was generated, kind of the, the, the attack was originated from. You're going to find, easily be able to track that down. And instead of spending a giant amount of time tracking down a quote unquote false positive, they can generally be kind of weeded out in a matter of seconds to minutes. So we are significantly reducing the amount of false positives. We are generating directly actionable information. And we're also creating a situation where false positives, if they were to occur, are extremely easy to identify. And that is the core aspect of cyber deception as a detection technology. So by placing resources on our network, keep in mind, the attacker does not know the difference between the production and the deceptive resources. The attacker doesn't know our environment. So when, when the attacker manages to gain a foothold, they're going to have to start looking around, trying to find other targets, trying to find other systems to migrate to, trying to find other credentials with elevated permissions, things like that. And those are the traps that we are now setting for the attacker. Because while the attacker does, you know, the attacker might on purpose or accidentally not interact with the majority of my deceptive technology. But all it takes is for the attacker to bump into one single deception resource and they're caught, right? It is really as simple as that. Now, you might be saying, well, that sounds awesome. Does it actually work? Well, there was a contracted report put together by Enterprise Management Associates. Uh, this was done like two years ago. Um, and it talked about users of deceptive technology or deception technology reported a 12 times improvement in average time to detect attackers. Uh, another report that I saw showed average detection uh, occurred in 5.5 days versus 28 to 212 days. So instead of 28 days, now we're down to 5.5 days. I've also seen a study that showed a 94.5% reduction in dwell time. That is gigantic. That is monstrous. And I would challenge you to find a single 
other technology or concept that can have that kind of benefit. 94%, 12 times improvement. And not only that, but we're also reducing the number of false positives we have, reducing alert fatigue in our SOC. And potentially, if we know that one out of three alerts generated by the SOC is a false positive, that means that technically one out of three SOC personnel is getting paid to do nothing except weed through false positives. Well, if we can reduce the number of false positives, we can also free up that resource to do other things or potentially reduce costs, whatever it is that you need to do. So this is an incredibly powerful detection solution um, that is absolutely amazing. Now, when I say it's an amazing, awesome, powerful detection solution, you might be thinking, well, does it replace my IDS? Does it replace my antivirus or my EDR, my XDR, or any other technology we have, whether it's protective or detect detective? The answer to that is probably no. Uh, and the reason why it's probably no is because I want all those other technologies on my network. Um, when I talk about detect or deception and changing the paradigm so that when we talk to, uh, you know, detecting stuff, instead of looking for abnormal or instead of, instead of looking for evil, we're looking for abnormal. It's a different approach. That doesn't mean the other approach where we look for evil is bad. It just has its limitations. Deception has its limitations as well. Um, it is, there are some challenges it, not unovercomable, but there are some challenges in getting the attackers to interact with our deception technology. So the way that we can do that is use all of the other controls that we have in our environment, because those controls have the effect of restricting the attacker's freedom of movement. What it mean, basically what I'm saying is if we've got things like firewalls and IDS and antivirus and NAC and whatever, if we've got all these cool technologies, those technologies are either going to stop the attacker from doing certain things. In other words, we have protective controls which stop the attacker from doing certain things. Um, the, other, the other aspect or the flip side of that coin is the attacker is only going to be willing to do certain things because if they do the wrong things, they're going to get detected, right? And then obviously, uh, so the attacker can only do certain things. The attacker is only going to be willing to do certain things. And then the attacker is going to be required to do certain things to evade my control. So by putting a bunch of other security controls in the network, we are significantly reducing the options available to the attacker. Great, that's awesome. So what does that mean from a deception perspective? What that means is that we don't need to randomly, chaotically, place our deception all over our network. What we have to do is understand what the attacker is going to do, what, what the attacker can do, what they cannot do, what they are willing to do, what they are unwilling to do. And then we place deception in the way of the attacker. So effectively, it's understand the attacker's behavior, their motivations, their limitations, uh, implemented by themselves or implemented by our controls. When we understand that, we can now place our deceptive resources in locations or make them available through situations that are likely to be employed by the attacker. This way, we can increase the likelihood that the attacker is going to interact with our deceptive technology. Uh, and again, it creates better and better and better deception. Now, in order to best do this, I do need to understand what the weaknesses or limitations of my existing security control structure is. Every single security environment everywhere has some level of weakness. There is no perfect security solution. So there are going to be some weaknesses. There are going to be some blind spots. Um, super simple example, when I talk about a bl blind spot, for example, uh, a lot of organizations might use a network-based intrusion detection system or an IDS. And they place that at the perimeter of their network so they can see all the traffic coming into their network and all the traffic leaving their network. <clears throat> well, what about all of the traffic that's happening inside the network, right? Now, you could place IDS solutions all over your network and gain that additional visibility, but there's a cost and complexity associated with doing that. So that would be an example of like a blind spot. 
Uh, now, if when we talk about all organizations have weaknesses, I want you to understand that when we looked at the numbers from the Ponemon Institute study and the M Trends report from uh, FireEye Mandiant, those include organizations with security controls, right? These are normal, typical organizations. They have all the controls. And when I say all, I'm just sort of being facetious here, but they have controls. They still got breached and it still took 28 to 212 days average to uh, detect those things. So how do we discover where the weaknesses are. So the idea is I wanna look at my current control structure. I wanna look at my current security program. I wanna find the weaknesses in that current security program. And then I wanna deploy deception to counter or combat those weaknesses. Now, there are a lot of ways we could do this. You can hire a penetration testing company. Uh, you can do red team exercises. You can do adversary emulation. I am, a, I, I, I'll be honest, I'm a fan of all of these, but under the right circumstance. So let's talk a little bit about pen testing, red team, and adversary emulation. So a penetration test is, again, we need to understand that different people have different definitions or different thought processes. The way that I look at a penetration test is it is a, a set of security tests, right? It, it, we can talk about the, the methodology and all that, but that's not really important. We're going to do tests, but the focus of a penetration test is finding gaps in your controls. Um, do you have the right visibility? Are you missing patches? You know, it's, it's more of a technological evaluation. We can also do things like red team exercises. Now, red team exercises are similar to penetration tests. In, in fact, you're gonna do a lot of the same actions as part of a red team as you would during a pen test. But the focus of a red team exercise is to evaluate the process uh, in other words, it's to evaluate how security is operated. So you might have an amazing set of controls. You might have, let's just say, an IDS structure that detects every bad thing that could possibly happen in your network. It's the world's best deployed IDS. It is almost perfect. But if nobody actually looks at it, and, and follows up with the alerts, then there's a problem. So red teaming is more focused on the people and the overall security program, whereas penetration testing is more focused on the gaps uh, in, in the actual technology or the actual control structure. Again, those definitions are a little bit fuzzy. Uh, different people might have different ideas. We're just going to level set here. Now, those are really awesome things to do if you want to evaluate your security control structure. The problem is that penetration testing and red team exercise are, are, are fairly manual processes that also involve a lot of time. And if you don't have the resources in-house to do it, you're going to end up with a bit of expense there as well. The other possibility is something called adversary emulation. Now, in theory, adversary emulation could be a very broad thing that includes penetration testing and red team exercises, but it has sort of commonly been more narrowly defined. So what I'm going to do with adversary emulation is I am going to define a set of adversarial uh, you know, techniques and tactics. In other words, uh, I'm going to use something like, and it doesn't have to be this, but something like MITRE's attack matrix. Um, and I'm going to say, oh, okay, well, uh, I believe my adversary is going to use these tactics and these techniques against my organization. Now, why do I believe that? Well, maybe I've received some threat intelligence that informs me that there are certain threat groups targeting organizations like mine. Uh, that utilize those, those techniques and tactics. Uh, maybe I suffered a previous breach that involves specific techniques and tactics that I want to check to make sure I'm covered for. Uh, it's that kind of thing. So the idea of adversary emulation is not to find out if somebody can get in. And it's not to find out really, can they you know, evade the tech? It, it's more to answer more specific questions. So the examples are, could the attack that we saw in the news happen to us? I heard about such and such attack. Could that happen to us? Or what, were ha what would happen if our systems were targeted by a threat group that was looking to profit from ransomware, things like that. So the idea is I can build out an entire attack and then execute that attack. 
And there are tools that can help us automate this. So for example, from a free perspective, we have things like MITRE Caldera. So with adversary emulation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to design an attack and then I'm going to deploy adversary emulation agents within the organization. So I'm going to assume the bad guy has gotten a foothold somehow, some way. Then I'm gonna deploy adversary emulation agents, and then I'm gonna to try to do all of the other fact, you know, functions of the attack and find out what my environment detected, what my people saw. Uh, I'm going to find the gaps. Now, the reason why I like the adversary emulation approach when it comes to evaluating for the purpose of designing deception is because once I get those adversary emulation uh, agents deployed, I can change the attack paradigm anytime I want very quickly and very easily. I don't need to go contract with another penetration tester or things like that. So really, really handy stuff that we can take a look at. So the idea is we identify some threat group or a set of techniques, for example, from MITRE's attack matrix. Uh, I get that from current events. I get that from cyber threat intelligence. I get that from a previous breach. I get that because maybe I just want to see if the, this combination of techniques would work. It doesn't have to be derived from anything. I then execute the adversary emulation. I basically run the routines that do all of the techniques and tactics and then review the security controls. What worked? What didn't work? What did I detect? And what did I not detect? And I'm going to focus on which of my controls didn't work and what wasn't detected. Now, if I have a control that didn't work, maybe I can tweak it or adjust it. If I know that certain actions weren't detected, I can now say, okay, we didn't detect this action. How can I deploy a deceptive control that would fill in that gap? And the fact is I can repeat this process as much and as often as I want. Now, completely shameless plug, um, when we start talking about adversary emulation, SANS does cover adversary emulation in a number of different classes. So definitely go ahead and take a look at that. I think the 699 class uh, is one that really focuses on adversary emulation. So definitely a cool thing to look at. So the benefits, the ability to redo things over and over again, automation being absolutely key. The idea when I go and I pull uh, attacker techniques from MITRE's attack matrix, that is, those are attacks that have actually been seen in the wild. It's not a theoretical construct. This could happen. These things have happened. The other thing when we talk about uh, penetration testing and red team exercises, there is a lot of reliance on the skill and knowledge and capability of the attacker in that case. In other words, if you hire a good penetration tester, you might get good results. If you hire a bad penetration tester that's not very good at what they do, you aren't going to get great results. So with adversary emulation, we're not really relying as much on the skill of the attacker. We're looking at kind of modeling typical attacks, which is pretty cool stuff. Uh, and again, Ideally, in a lot of these cases, if I'm doing this for the purpose of detecting attackers with cyber deception, I don't really care how the bad guy gets in. I know that the bad guys are going to get in somehow, some way, right? I'm going to assume at least initial breach and then move on from that perspective. Now, one of the things that I will point out is when we talk about adversary emulation, um, it's going to benefit greatly from understanding as much as we can about the attackers. And that's another key piece here. So how do I understand up about the attackers? Like, in other words, how do I learn attacker motivations, techniques, tactics, whatever? There are a variety of ways to do it. Two really common ways uh, for more defensive oriented people are what I call modeling. So what we can do is we can look at things like MITRE's attack matrix, the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain, the unified kill chain. Those all provide models of attacker behavior. So I can look at that and try to incorporate that into my design. The other thing is getting cyber threat intelligence. Now, cyber threat intelligence is a really interesting capability, but it has some current limitations. Uh, the biggest limitation is that if I want to get cyber threat intelligence that is specific to my environment, that is absolutely specific to my environment, I have to suffer a breach. Because the only way we're going to get cyber, uh, cyber threat intelligence is to analyze what the attacker did in my environment when they compromised it. So I have to incur the cost of a breach. Now, if I've been breached, 
I absolutely want to do what I can to collect cyber threat intelligence because the breach has already happened. But aside from that, it's very difficult in most cases to be able to collect cyber threat intelligence that is specific to my organization. Now, I can contract with any of a variety of cyber threat intelligence um, uh, I'll say cyber threat intelligence providers, right? These are folks that are providing cyber threat intelligence to different organizations. Now, the problem is that information is not going to be environment or organization specific. It might be specific to certain industries, certain geographies, certain technologies, those types of things, but it's still going to be somewhat generic, right? So we have some challenges when it comes to cyber threat intelligence. Um, but if we can use that to guide how we build our security programs and how we deploy our deception, that's going to be a really cool thing. Now, as we get into this, we can also look at, hey, wait a minute, hmm, I've created a bunch of non-production deceptive resources in my environment. So, if the attacker can't tell the difference between the real systems and the deceptive systems, and if the attacker is interacting with the deceptive systems, they are A, not causing me any harm, and B, providing me with cyber threat intelligence. So by creating a structure of production-like systems, that actually have no production data or no production value, we give the attacker a playground that they can go work through. Now, it, as they do so, I can look at the tools that they use. I can look at what their goals are. I can infer what their goals and objectives are, the tactics, the methods, the signatures of the attacker. When I say a signature, I'm not talking about an IDS signature. What I'm talking about is what is the what does the attacker do from a behavioral perspective? Do they uh, utilize a common password? Do they send information to a common um you know, uh, IP address, something along those lines. Now, the whole concept of cyber threat intelligence generation, again, shameless plug. Uh, and Randall, I saw that you posted the uh, the sec five, or 699 one. Uh, if you could drop a link to the cyber threat intelligence class, the forensics 570 something, I, I forget what it is. That'd be awesome. But if you want to learn about how to collect cyber threat intelligence, that's a really cool class there. And the advantage here is that once we understand what the attackers are going to do and what they're looking for and those types of things, we can do a better job of stopping them. Thank you, by, by the way, Randall. We can do a better job of stopping the attackers, but we can also do a better job of placing our deceptive resources in locations or situations that are going to be attractive to the attacker. Uh, there was a situation back in the 80s um, where the United States government became aware of a, uh, I'll call it an espionage campaign on the part of the Soviet Union, where the Soviets were trying to get their hands on a bunch of technology. And they did so through out and out theft, espionage type stuff, or by setting up shell companies and then making purchases. And so the US got the full list of all of the players, kind of what they were interested in. But instead of um, going out and arresting a bunch of people. Um, again, this guy, Guy Weiss, uh, he had made a quote. He was uh, in, in, the, in the Reagan administration at the time. He said, why not help the Soviets with their shopping? Now that we know what they want, we can help them get it. So the U.S. became aware that the Soviets were going to attempt to purchase a technology through a Canadian technology company. The U.S. worked with the Canadian government to create fake technology. The fake technology was done in such a way that it would pass the Soviets' um, quality assurance tests. But when it was put into production in, a, I think it was a natural gas pipeline in Siberia, the result was the largest non-nuclear exp explosion seen from space. So the fact of the matter is, if we know what the attackers are after, if we know their methods, if we know their techniques, we can give that to them under our circumstances, under our control. We can, we can do exactly what was done to the Soviets back at that time. And that's sort of the premise of cyber deception. Now, the cool thing is, if I have good cyber threat intelligence, 
that means I can do better deception because I know my adversary more effectively. I know what they look for. I know what they do. I know the methods. I know all of that kind of stuff. So if I know what the attackers are going to look for, I place my deception based on that knowledge. Now, the cool thing about this is once I have my deception in place, it now allows me to collect better cyber threat intelligence. And then better cyber threat intelligence allows me to do better deception, which allows me to collect better threat cyber or cyber threat intelligence and so on and so forth. So the entire process is this self-improving loop. And throughout it, I can evaluate and test my own information by taking that cyber threat intelligence and feeding it into my adversary emulation process. And now I've got this perpetual feedback loop that involves kind of perpetual self-improvement as well. Um, and this is one of those areas where when people actually deploy a cyber de deception or deception technology, they get a little bit weirded out. Because as I said before, it is a high fidelity, low noise detection capability, which means that it, you don't see a lot of alerts. And for organizations that are used to seeing tens or hundreds of thousands of alerts a day, seeing no alerts whatsoever, you start questioning, well, is this thing even working? Well, one of the ways that you can easily evaluate whether it's working is to go back into your adversary emulation, deploy adversary emulation and watch how the deception catches it, which is pretty cool stuff. So we end up with these cool, awesome feedback loops into the entire process, which is absolute gold. All right, one other topic that I wanted to cover is this aspect of zero trust. Zero trust is a very popular and, and by all accounts, very effective security architecture or security model. If you're, if you're not that familiar with zero trust, uh, I'm going to cover it at a really high level. So the idea is in a traditional network, in an old school network, if I got access to the network, right, if I could plug into an open port or if I could compromise a system, I gained instantly a lot of permissions. Now, I don't mean application level permissions, but if I'm connected up to your network, I can find out what ports are open, what systems are there, and then I can start interacting with those ports. I can sniff network traffic, all of that kind of fun stuff. So the idea in a traditional old school network is that access to the network gives you some level of permissions. And so the attackers get on our networks uh, maybe they don't even have credentials, but they sniff network traffic, they extract credentials from memory, so on and so forth. But now they can interact with every single production system, and that becomes a bit of a problem. Now, as we implement zero trust, zero trust is a little bit of a misnomer in that if you really want to be particular about it, yes, we are granting trust, but we're granting trust based on specific criteria. And those criteria typically end up being identity and context. So First and foremost, no matter where you are, whether you're on the internet, whether you're at your home office, whether you're connected up to the company's network, you have your computer connected to that network with an IP address has no inherent permissions whatsoever. You have to identify yourself to that environment. And that identity ultimately gives you some permissions. Now, there's also this aspect of context. So for example, if I log in, if I have my laptop, and I log into my laptop with a valid credential, but we have previously become aware that that laptop was compromised with some malware, then the context of the malware might prevent me from using my laptop to interact with the environment. But if I use the same identity on my desktop that hadn't been compromised, I now get access. Now, this is all done at a high level via what are called policy enforcement points and policy decision engines. So a policy enforcement point is basically a security control. It's going to allow or deny access or limit it or whatever. It could literally be a firewall. It could be functionality built into an application or anything in between. Now, the policy enforcement points are the enforcement points for the policy. The policy decision engine defines kind of who's going to be allowed under what circumstances. So the idea is, even if I'm a bad guy and I gain a foothold into your network, I have very, very, very limited benefits. If I walk up to your network and plug into a live open network jack, there's not really anything that I can do with a well-designed zero trust architecture. 
What I have to do is I have to gain access to the, you know, I have to gain access to credentials. I have to get, I have to take over an identity. And then, of course, I have to make sure that I don't trigger any of those context-based responses. So, great. Is it possible for an attacker to gain uh, credentials? And the answer, of course, is yes. And this is where the, the kind of big weakness of zero trust comes in. I am a huge fan of zero trust. I think it's a really good model. But if the attacker manages to compromise a credential and then behaves themselves, then we have a little bit of a problem. So when those credentials get compromised, um, the attacker is going to end up having the ability to access information appropriate to whatever credentials they got. Now, here's where things get interesting, because in general, the attackers don't know the environment. They don't know what they have access to. And so unlike a user, a, a legitimate normal user is typically going to get on, you know, log in in the morning, they're going to do their work, they're going to log off at the end of the day, and that's all they do. It's fairly predictable. But an attacker is going to have to explore. And this is where deception can come into play. Because what if I placed deceptive resources in the zero trust environment? So the attacker gains some level of access. They gain some identity. They get some credentials or whatever. They start exploring around. Let's go see what I can get access to. Oh my gosh, I have access to this computer and that computer and that other computer over there. I have access to this application and I can connect up to that open port. Awesome, except that every one of those systems was deceptive in nature, or maybe not everyone, but maybe even a couple of them were deceptive in nature, but all it takes is the attacker to interact with a single one and we've caught them. So we have filled in much of the gap that is possible in a zero trust architecture. Now, there's actually a little bit more that you can do by combining zero trust and deception. Yes, deception can fill that. I, I got an identity stolen gap, but it does a lot more. We talked about using deception to collect cyber threat intelligence. And I said, as long as the attacker is interacting with our deceptive resources and not our productive production resources, we can watch what they do and no harm occurs. But what stops them from migrating from deceptive resources to production? Well, there's a lot of ways you can do it, but zero trust is an amazing capability. Because remember, zero trust, if, if designed correctly, can make systems appear to not exist on a network. I cannot interact with that system in any way, shape, or form. So once I detect the attack, however I detect it, whether it's traditional detection or better yet, if it's deception, once I detect that the bad guy is attacking me, I know the IP address the bad guy is coming from, I then create a policy in my policy decision engine that gets fed out to the policy enforcement points, which now make it appear to the attacker that the entirety of the production network doesn't exist anymore. They can't send a packet, they can't ping it, they can't interact with it in any way, shape, or form. The only thing we have left available via our policy enforcement points is for the attackers to interact with the deceptive resources. So now we have a full-blown environment that we can watch the attacker all day long. The attacker cannot break out of it because they have been prohibited it doing so via the zero trust architecture. And that, my friends, is almost magic, right? Really, really cool stuff. Um, now, the reason why this can work, right? You don't want to make giant policy enforcement decisions um, based on inaccurate detection. So if I don't have a high degree of confidence that detect that my detection is valid, I really don't want to start blocking everything because I could disrupt production traffic. But again, because deception provides high fidelity, low noise uh, detection, we can use deception when the attacker interacts with the deceptive resource, that IP address is then handed out to the policy decision engine. The policies are pushed out to the policy enforcement points, and we have some amazing stuff. Now, um, we had a, a question on the, uh, the chat. Is this, is this something similar to honeypots? 
it's it is um, in other a lot of the concepts are derived from the aspect of a honeypot. But there's actually quite a bit more to cyber deception than honeypots. We have been talking about cyber deception in a very honeypot like context. But as I said at the very beginning, there's a lot more that we can do with deception that is beyond the stuff we're talking about here, right? So when I talk about this true cyber deception, it's not just about creating fake resources. It's about positioning information. It's about, it's about manipulating the behavior of an attacker by positioning information to influence their decision-making process. So by creating a bunch of fake resources, I affect their de decision-making process. But I might also wanna make actual production valid information available to the attacker. Now, probably not top secret information, but if I, uh, if I make ve um, verifiably true information available to the attacker, then my messaging gets believed even more. Uh, part of deception is also keeping the bad guys away from production information, so restricting or denying access. And in some cases, I may even want to take my deception and hide it from the attacker not hide the fact that it's deceptive, but to hide the deceptive resources from the attacker, make them work at trying to discover that. Uh, so there's a whole strategy. Uh, we can take informational deceptive resources and push them all the way out to the internet to change the attacker's perspective. We can actually counter the attacker's reconnaissance and weaponization phases. So it's kind of, at, at one level, it is it's definitely something similar to honeypots, on another level, though, it is much more of a strategy that uses honeypots as opposed to just being honeypots, if that makes sense. So as we dig into this thing, as we go to wrap things up, and again, uh, if anybody has any questions, definitely now is a great time to, uh, to post them. Uh, just as a, a big summary, breakout time on average is about an hour and a half. Dwell time is weeks to months. So that's a huge problem. There is a direct relationship. The cost of the breach is proportional to the dwell time. Uh, the dwell time is aggravated by the fact that bad guys can evade our detection and we get too many alerts, uh, so we might miss things. What, what I'm suggesting is instead of traditionally looking for evil, we adjust things to looking for abnormal. And we utilize deceptive resources. We can reduce dwell time by over 90%, depending upon the thing that we're looking at. Um, we can improve and validate our, we, we, can, we can identify weaknesses in our control structure, and then we can validate our controls, including deception on an ongoing basis using adversary emulation. Cyber threat intelligence can be collected using deception, but it can also be fed into deception to create better deception, which is pretty awesome stuff. And then of course, if we implement things like zero trust, deception has a role there, particularly in a situation where a bad guy uh, has compromised a, an ID. Uh, or an, an identity. Uh, and then we can also take that zero trust and use it to manipulate the environment after detection has occurred to limit the attacker only to those deceptive resources with really cool stuff. So again, as, uh, as Randall just posted, uh, if this stuff is in any way interesting uh, to you, we have a six day long SANS class, hands-on activities, all of that kind of fun stuff. In that class, we cover things like what is cyber deception in a little bit more detail than we did here. Why do we need it? What are its benefits? What are the types of deceptive resources you can use? Why you would use those different resources? How all of that kind of fun stuff. Uh, we talk about different goals of cyber deception. Predominantly here, we talked about um, detection and threat intelligence collection a little bit. We go into that in more detail, but we also talk about distraction and delay, uh, counter reconnaissance we go into, uh, and, and then active adversary engagement and adversary action manipulation, which is pretty cool stuff. We talk about how we understand our own environment, and we go into more detail about how we understand the adversary to, to do effective 
uh, deception. We talk about how how important realism is when it comes to deception and under what circumstances to different levels of realism uh, need to be employed. And throughout the whole thing, we talk about how do we design, implement, test, and operate an overall cyber deception strategy. Um, Randall posted a link in there. Uh, I also have a company called Deceptive Defense, and I've got a little shorter link, deceptive-defense.com forward slash sec550, which will take you directly to the SANS uh, link that Randall provided as well. So we get some options there as well. I uh, also wanted to provide my contact information. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. Uh, I've got a couple of businesses that I run and my SANS email address is provided there as well. Um, we are right up knocking on the end of the scheduled time for this event, but I, I will definitely be happy if anyone does want to post a question or two. I will happily uh, answer that. If you want to hit me up and connect up on LinkedIn or Twitter, please feel free to do so. Uh, if you have questions that you would want to kind of cover offline, uh, feel free to shoot me an email, kfiscusatsands.org. I will more than happily do that. Uh, I will also more than happily send you a copy of the slide deck for this. Now, now, I believe this is being recorded, so you can go back and watch the whole thing. But if you do want a copy of the slide deck, please shoot me an email, kfiscusatsands.org, and I will more than happily get that out to you. Uh, yeah, and Randall had posted a copy of the slides and a recording of the webcast will be available for viewing and can be found on the SANS registration page. And he gave the link for that. So uh, if you wanted to share this recording, let other people take a look at it, that kind of fun stuff, you are more than welcome to do it. If you have questions about cyber deception, if you have questions about my class for cyber deception, uh, or for that matter, any of the other classes that I teach, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, definitely appreciate you guys taking the time uh, and learning a little bit more about cyber deception uh, and keep your eyes peeled because within the next uh, week or so, you will see the specific uh, scheduling for the Security 550 class. So if you if you were interested in that, uh, you can go ahead and register for that. But again, um, I'll go ahead and, and I, I don't see any additional questions there. So I'm gonna just say thank you guys so much. I appreciate you taking the time out of your day uh, to learn a little bit about cyber deception. And if you have any questions whatsoever, please do not hesitate to reach out. Thank you guys so much and have a fantastic whatever happens to be rest of uh, the rest of your day. Thank you guys so much and I appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, we, we appreciate you bringing this content to the SANS community. Uh, it is greatly appreciated. And uh, thank you very much to our audience for listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and on-demand SANS webcasts, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. And in the meantime, take care and we hope to see you again soon. Bye for now.